this is uh, fairly self-evident too. This is this is uh, a little later after Bo has been in Hollywood for a bit and he's not quite so green. Uh, there's a scene in which he and Jack Nicholson and uh, a couple of other sort of young Hollywood aspirants are in a nightclub watching the birds and Bo uh, picks up a waitress and somehow persuades her to go get a cup of coffee with him at two o'clock in the morning. And this is just a little scene between what happens with him and the waitress. They careened along the strip in his battered white 1963 Jaguar. Bo drove like a man who'd just been introduced to the wheel. Not Greenblatt's tonight. Cantor's, egg salad, and the 2 a.m. confession. There, too, he kept the focus off himself, even as his fingers dented the thick-cut yellow holla and he talked with his mouth full. Eat he said. She watched him like someone coming down to earth, wondering what everyone in the room had to be asking. What was she doing there with him? <laughs> the radio piped jazz from another decade. Tony Bennett was like a sudden restoration of sanity. Everybody's hungry, Bo said. Everybody wants something. How did you get to be this way? She said. Which way? He burped gently. What are you talking about? She nodded up and down, but it wasn't just his body. Even the way he parked his car was spasmodic, strange, violent, elegant, jerking it into a space where it wouldn't quite fit, and then banging his palms on the wheel. My mom, he said finally. It's all her fault. Really? As if this wasn't, too, something he'd spent his entire life thinking about. As if this question wasn't the whole of his being. Sure. Still chewing, he smiled. Ask a Jewish man, we'll always blame our, blame our mothers, because if we don't, we'll catch hell for criticizing our fathers. They sat in the orange booth, the candid light of the delicatessen, the pebbled floor like an obscure beach, tan and coarse. The waitresses wobbled on orthopedic shoes, the ceiling tiles stained glass patterns shone in the surface of their coffees. You know, you're not that ugly, she tilted her head. You don't have to be, from your lips to God's ears. No, she shook a cigarette from his red pack with its white crest and its Latin motto. I mean it. Her hands flew, but his were quicker as he lifted his lighter across the table to spark it. You're almost appealing. Thank you, he watched her. Marry me. What? You heard. He couldn't possibly be serious, but he was. She burst out laughing. Not if you were the last person on earth. <laughs> she hissed smoke. Sorry. Oh. Having heard this all his life, he could scarcely even suffer hurt feelings. Ah. Thought I'd ask. <laughs> Keep trying. I will. Why don't you sleep with me? She laughed again. Keep trying elsewhere. I mean, you know, a, a lot. Uh, I, I did, I mean, I grew up here, and then I moved away for, for 15 years, so... Um, to New York. Yeah, to New York and, and San Francisco and London. I, I lived a kind of fistful of other places. Um, so I wouldn't say, I mean, it wasn't a sort of, it was a very Im impressionistic return. You know, I was sort of drawing on places that I can remember visiting uh, in my 20s and, and 30s and, you know, and, and trying to deal with not just the sort of deep past of Los Angeles, you know, the, the Chandler past, the old Hollywood past, but also the, the, the more contemporary past. You know, I, I felt that the great books about Los Angeles, the great books that treat that aspect of Los Angeles, whether it's The Player or Nathaniel West, or, you know, even books like Robert Stone's Children of Light, like these were all books that I was looking at and loving, and at the same time feeling a little bit like, um, boy, these books are sort of cruel. <laughs> and, uh, and I felt like, well, there's a lot to be cruel towards. I mean, it's not like the movie business is a, is a you know, basket of warm puppies. But there's a lot of a lot of humanity in it, and a lot of you know. I mean, I've I've worked in it, um, I've lived around it, and I, I wanted to write like a a, a warm-blooded book about about what is widely considered to be a cold-blooded industry. There was a moderate amount of research. I, you know, I, I'm one of those writers who tends to do his research after I've written the thing, uh, so which can sometimes be really hair-raising and tough. Uh, in this case, I felt like I, because I had a narrator who was not present or not alive for a lot of the scenes, I felt like that actually gave me room to, room to breathe, because I could let the narrator 
have certain things be vivid. I mean, the, the telling itself could be subjective enough that um, that the narrator could encompass some of the things that I didn't, you know, could, I could allow him some of my ignorance as well, which is helpful. <laughs>